have. You have the beginning of the film here. This stuff is the black and white stuff. This is color, and this is running backwards. We cut between the two. Seen here, seen there, seen there, seen there, seen there, seen there, and they meet towards the end of the film. The end of the film being sort of there-ish. Christopher Nolan is one of the great filmmakers of our time. Even if you're not a full-on Nolan fanboy or fangirl, his brand of mixing mind-bending narratives with a genuine reverence for the craft always yields compelling results, be it historical drama, suspenseful mystery, or colossal action thrillers. The man knows how to deliver a picture that gets the adrenaline and the brain working. And that's a rare feat. But it all had to start somewhere, and while we're not exactly going back to the very beginning, we're going to highlight the movie that introduced Chris Nolan to the world and kick-started his incredibly successful career. Don't quite recall which movie we're talking about? Don't worry, we made a note of it. In fact, we've got plenty of notes scribbled down about it somewhere, so try your best to remember everything we're going to tell you as we find out what the f*** happened to this movie. The story of Memento begins with a road trip. Brothers Christopher and Jonathan were driving across the country from Chicago to LA when Jonathan began telling Chris about a short story he was writing called Memento Mori, which is Latin for Remember You Must Die. The story followed a man named Earl who has enterograde amnesia, meaning he can't create new memories. Earl uses notes and tattoos instead to keep track of his recent history because he's on the hunt for the man who both killed his wife and caused his terrible condition. Christopher was very intrigued by the idea and offered to write a script for it while Jonathan continued to pen his own story. The younger brother agreed, though it would take him about five years before he completed this story, longer than it would actually take to complete the movie. But we'll get to that in a bit. One note Christopher made was that both should tell the story in the first person, meaning we only know as much as the protagonist knows at any given time. The big difference would be Christopher's version would be told backwards. Nolan wrote the script from first shot to last shot in the order we eventually see the movie in, meaning he didn't write it in linear fashion and then rearrange it all later. He always wanted to be in the audience's head as they discover just what the hell is going on with this main character, who he eventually called Leonard. When writing, Nolan made sure he was aware of all of the answers of the mystery at the center of the story. He knew there had to be an objective truth at the end of the film, or else he'd be cheating the audience. He knew it would be the kind of film that had to be watched more than once to be fully appreciated. As the filmmaker, he correctly figured he'd be two or more steps ahead of the audience during the entirety of that first viewing. Only after a second or third viewing would everything come into focus for the viewer. This would end up being a central goal for the director throughout his entire career. Nolan shared the idea with his then-girlfriend, Emma Thomas, who he'd eventually marry and become producing partners with. And she thought it was an exciting idea filled with a whole lot of potential. A script supervisor herself, Emma shared the script with an up-and-coming producer named Aaron Ryder, who loved it and brought it to New Market Films, which was just getting off the ground at the time. Summit Entertainment would eventually come on to co-produce, and eventually the film would be given a green light and a budget in the $5 million range. Quite a leap for Nolan, who'd made his debut following for just a few thousand bucks. The script began to make the rounds, passing through talent agencies and into the hands of some real deal actors. One such actor was Brad Pitt, who read the script and expressed interest in it at the time, around 1999. Pitt met with Nolan, which wowed the young director, who admitted there was no reason for the Hollywood heartthrob to meet with him, aside from the fact that he enjoyed the script. Ultimately, nothing came of that. But the very fact that Pitt had sat down with Nolan about playing Leonard sent some waves throughout the town. If this was a movie Brad Pitt was considering making, maybe it really was worth a look. Nolan later credited the meeting with helping light a fire under Memento 
saying it perked up interest in what was otherwise a very obscure project. That's how it came to Guy Pierce's attention, as it was sent to him by an agent who wrote a note at the bottom that read, You're going to love it. The actor was coming off a handful of breakout roles in the mid to late 90s, such as The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, and L.A. Confidential. The producers of Memento were impressed by how different he was in those roles and regarded the Australian actor as a chameleon, a descriptor quite fitting for a role such as Leonard. Pierce boarded Memento two weeks before it was meant to get rolling. It was also Pierce's idea to dye Leonard's hair blonde, giving him a very specific and memorable, pun intended, look. Another crucial element of Leonard's exterior are the many tattoos that litter his body, each providing a small clue as to his mission. Every day, Pierce would have to get the fake tattoos applied to his body in the morning, sometimes forcing production to work around this process, shooting scenes he wasn't needed while the tattoos were drawn on him. Interestingly, Pierce was on set every day of the 25-day production, regardless if he was in the scene or not. But let's face it, he's in practically every scene. For the role of duplicitous bartender Natalie, Nolan went with Carrie Ann Moss after being impressed with her turn as Trinity in The Matrix, eventually saying that she added an enormous amount to the role that wasn't even on the page. For the part of the equally duplicitous Teddy, the ex-cop who uses Leonard for his own nefarious purposes, Nolan originally went to Dennis Leary, then famous for his uber sarcastic tough guy persona. But Leary, or his agents, weren't impressed with the salary being offered and turned it down. It was Carrie Ann Moss who suggested her Matrix co-star Joe Pantoliano for the role, an idea Nolan initially resisted. For the director, he thought the audience wouldn't trust Teddy right from the start if he were played by the infamous Joey Pants who'd made a career out of portraying fast-talking bad guys. If Teddy seemed too shady or villainous, neither the audience nor Leonard would go along with it. But after meeting with Joe, Nolan was convinced the actor could pull off playing a character who's both likable and suspicious at the same time. Turns out, Joey Pants brought quite a bit to the project in addition to his acting skills. He gave Nolan a book filled with crime scene photographs that would ultimately inspire the bloody Polaroid picture that opens the film. Nolan didn't want the shooting of Teddy to be overly grotesque because it could mean alienating the audience right off the bat. So, Pantoliano also suggested the shot of the eyeglasses being violently tossed to the ground. This, he imagined, would indicate the nastiness of the act without fully showing it, and Nolan took the advice. A small but crucial supporting role is Sammy Jenkins, a character Leonard continues to reference throughout the film. As a plot device, Sammy allows Nolan to explain to the audience exactly how the condition Leonard has works, and it allows us entry into Leonard's past as an insurance investigator, something else crucial to the story as it gives Nolan the license to depict our hero as not the most lovable of guys in his former life. In any event, the role of Sammy ended up in the lap of Steven Tobolowski, the beloved character actor best known for playing the punchable Ned Ryerson in Groundhog Day. As Tobolowski describes it, the script for Memento was somewhere around 300 pages long. Thanks to its unusual structure and the fact that Nolan described every single detail in it, camera angles and otherwise, Tobolowski resisted reading it because a standard script is usually 90 to 120 pages, but he did so anyway. By the time he finished the script, he was convinced it was the best he had ever read. The role meant a lot to the actor for another reason. He actually had amnesia for a time in his life and went through exactly what Sammy Jankis and Leonard went through. Thanks to a drug-induced amnesia he lived with briefly after he underwent surgery. The actor went on to say it was the most difficult part he ever had to play in his entire career, despite Sammy's small amount of screen time. Nolan was meticulous, big surprise there, right, in how he shot the film. For the majority of Memento, we're essentially living in Leonard's world, learning what he learns on the go. Nolan uses many camera angles that bring us close to Leonard, indicating we're in his headspace. When he moves from point A to point B, 
we often follow along right behind them. During the film's one linear stretch, the black and white sequences we keep cutting back to as Leonard talks on the phone with an unknown person, the shots are more objective, sometimes staged like security camera or documentary footage to give us a little remove from being inside of his head. Speaking of Lenny's head, the characters' voiceovers were, for the most part, ad-libbed by Guy Pearce sometimes off the cuff, sometimes while he was watching the rough footage on a monitor. Nolan and his editor, Doty Dorn, would ultimately fine-tune the cuts to Pierce's voiceovers as the character slowly discovers what he's doing in the moment. For the question of how long does Leonard remember at any given time, Nolan was flexible and says on the film's commentary track, Lenny can remember only as long as he's able to concentrate on one single thing. So, some scenes might go on longer while Leonard is in the moment, while others might end up being quite a bit shorter if his attention is thrown off. Most of them, however, are in the same ballpark in terms of duration. Only a handful of scenes show us Leonard actually forgetting what he's doing, such as the scene in the bathroom after he's been chased by Dodd. After the film was finished, New Market attempted to reach a distribution deal with some of the big studios in town. Producer Aaron Ryder sent it to all the major players, including DreamWorks, Sony, Universal, Paramount, and Miramax, and he was rejected every single time. It started to seem like they had worked two to three years on a movie no one would give a chance. The film went through the festival circuit and won accolade after accolade, premiering at the Venice Film Festival and eventually hitting several others like Toronto and Sundance, the latter being where it won Best Screenplay. Despite all the love, the studios thought it was going to be too confusing for general audiences and were convinced it would never make a profit. Finally, New Market, the company that helped finance it, decided it would release it themselves, starting slowly in about 12 theaters in LA and New York, and then expanding. Once it became obvious this movie was going to be a critical and commercial hit, some of the studios apparently came crawling back. According to Aaron Ryder, one studio, rumored to be Miramax, made a belated offer to buy it, acknowledging their mistake in initially passing. Ryder, for his part, refused, and New Market handled the film's distribution throughout the spring of 2001. It ultimately wound up in around 500 theaters in North America, earning a domestic gross of $25 million, with another 15 overseas. Da, 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 da. It's the one and only in addition to numerous awards from festivals and critic circles, Memento nabbed two Oscar nominations for Best Editing and Best Original Screenplay. It was considered original because Jonathan's short story still hadn't been published by the time the movie came out. It didn't win either, but sometimes being invited to that particular party is more than enough for a movie like Memento. Obviously, the film was a major success considering its humble roots and low budget, but what it really did was launch the career of Christopher Nolan, who was quickly labeled one of the most intriguing new artists in the industry. Before Memento was even released, he was already working on his first studio project, Insomnia, thanks to Steven Soderbergh, who insisted Warner Brothers give the Helmer a chance after he got a look at Memento. Nolan was handed the Batman franchise soon after, and it goes without saying he and Warner Brothers enjoyed many a success after Insomnia for well over a decade. Memento was not only a great film in its own right, it helped give credibility to a director who's consistently been delivering must-see pictures for over 20 years. And the most interesting part of the story is... Wait, where was it?